Hey everybody, I'm Isabella Jimenez. I use she, her pronouns, and I am just based outside of Dallas, Texas. And I just completed my sophomore year in high school. So today I'm gonna to be moderating this session on behalf of the It Gets Better program, a nonprofit organization with the mission to uplift, empower, and connect LGBTQ plus youth around the globe. <clears throat> I am one of the organization's Youth Voices, which is the name of the official Youth Ambassador Program for the organization, part of It Gets Better EDU, the educational branch of the organization. Today, I'm here with my close friends, Tammy, Jace, and Zach, who are also Youth Voices for the It Gets Better Project. So, just kick us all off. Tammy, why don't you introduce yourself to us? Hello, everyone. My name is Hammy Hamilton. I, I reside in Mobile, Alabama and I am 17 years of age. Um, and yeah, I am one of the ambassadors for the Youth Voice program. Okay, Jace, your turn. I'm Jay Steininger. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I am a Youth Voice. I've been a Youth Voice this year. Um, I just graduated my junior year of high school and I can't wait to do more panels. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I'm excited to have you on more panels too. Okay, Zach, your turn. Hi, I'm Zach. I use he, him pronouns. I'm based out of Baltimore, um, but I just graduated high school last week. And so this is unfortunately my last summer with It Gets Better. We're gonna miss you, Zach. You'll always be in our hearts. Okay, so now for the fun stuff. So part of the work of the It Gets Better EDU is to help schools become inclusive, inclusive spaces for all LGBTQ plus students. According to GLSEN, schools need four things in order for LGBTQ plus students to really thrive like their peers. Inclusive curriculum, supportive educators, inclusive and supportive policies, and supportive student clubs like GSAs. So speaking of GSAs, Jace, let's have you start off with the first one, inclusive curriculum. Why do you think it's important that our schools use an inclusive curriculum? Well, I think that the first and foremost important reason is <clears throat> that um, students get seen at their school and they feel like they're represented fairly by um, what is taught. Um, I know that a lot of the times I know that I've been disappointed when we've done a history class or done a health class and LGBTQ topics weren't brought up because these like history has so much to do with the LGBTQ community, but a lot of people don't feel like it's necessary to show it in a school setting, which, you know, just leaves people like me to not know who, you know, Marsha P. Johnson is unless I, you know, take the time myself and do the research. So I think that for students who aren't queer and interested in queer history and stuff like that, it's important for it to be taught in schools because then they know the knowledge and they don't have to go searching for it by themselves and accidentally stumble across, you know, the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. That is totally understandable. And I actually really agree with that. I feel like it's so hard these days to get a really nice education from your teachers in a super like educational way, I guess. But how do you think that LGBTQ plus community has been represented in your school's curriculum, if at all? So I take a really <laughs> great class called Current Issues and Social Change, which um, is led by one of my favorite teachers in the whole world. He's great. Um, he um, our last unit was on queer theory, which, you know, is something I was like, queer theory, what's that? And, you know, I'm a queer person, um, and I have known that for, for years and years, and I had no idea what this was. And so it was a really great opportunity to be able to learn about my own identity in a class. And I felt really, you know, supported by the teacher. He, he had clearly like done his research and he knows how to talk to people and, and teach this material. So he was really knowledgeable and I really feel super lucky to have been part of his class. I'm taking the class again next year because I loved it so much. Um, in other classes, you know, I'll see references to like Harvey Milk, like my English class used one of his quotes and one of his speeches for an assignment and in history, although it was incredibly brief and not a very in-depth analysis, we did go over <clears throat> Stonewall, um, which was really cool to see because you don't usually get that in a school 
And I was really surprised because, you know, living in Utah, that kind of stuff you would expect to not be in the curriculum at all. So I feel really lucky that our teachers feel that it is important to t teach us about these things. I am so glad that your school has been so progressive. I wish that my school had wow. a queer theory class. No, stop. <laughs> I wish that my school had a queer theory class. Actually, I've never heard about that. Can you tell me like one of the things that you learned in that class or like what like the units look like, you know? So the class <clears throat> kind of went through different steps. We talked about um, racism and like racial identities and how that interacts with society. And we talked about feminism and how female, you know, identifying people interact with society and different aspects of how this, how our world kind of interacts with minorities. Um, so we read this really great book. It's called How to Be an Anti-Racist by uh, Dr. Kendi. Um, he is a really great author and that book was incredible. Um, I love the book so much that I bought it um, for my mom as a gift. Um, and that, I learned so much from that. Um, we talked a lot. One of, one of the things that keeps sticking in my mind from our feminism unit was talking about um, female rage and how, you know, anger in women is represented in, you know, our world, our culture. <clears throat> um, and something that I found really interesting was that we talked about how for a lot of people, gender identity is a reflection of the self and of society back onto itself, which is something that I had never really thought of before. And so, I mean, I the stuff I learned in this class is going to stay with me for the rest of my life. That is so incredible. I actually really like that a lot. Okay, I also have another question about your queer theory class. What are the students like in that class? Like, have you ever experienced like any problematic students or anyone just looking for trouble? Or do you think it's mostly like a supportive environment? Um, since it's an elective class, um, people chose to take it. So there weren't, there wasn't anybody there who, you know, chose to take the class specifically to troll and everything. Everyone in that class was really supportive and really <laughs> open to learning the material and open it, open to their views being challenged. Um, you know, just outright saying like what you've been taught is wrong. Um, that is so incredible. Oh my gosh. I literally love that so much. So with all these incredible and supportive and educational, like just literally perfect like ideas in this class, what do you think could be better within your inclusive curriculum at your school? Um, I would have loved to do a more extensive uh, unit on it in my history class. Um, I was a little disappointed by, you know, the brief and not very well researched um, information that our history teacher gave us. I really hope he's not watching this. <laughs> um, but we went over it briefly and it, you know, the information didn't seem like the most correct because again, I've done like extensive research on my own. And so the stuff he was saying about Stonewall didn't seem correct. And um, it kind of made it seem like queer people, you know, just cropped up sometime in the sixties where in reality, queer people have been around as long as, you know, people, in general have been around. So I really would have liked to see the integration of that throughout, you know, the year. But I know that can be asking a bit much. Um, and I would have loved to have learned more about queer people in my sex ed classes. Mm -hmm. No, I feel like that is always such like an incredible topic to discuss in sex ed classes. I actually have never really been to a sex ed class. So I don't know if I can really talk on that. But anyways, <laughs> Um, Hammy, I actually wanted to ask you about your um, experience with inclusive curriculum in your school. I know you live in Alabama, so it can be kind of tough, but what's your take on it? Um, well, in Alabama in general, we don't have inclusive in cur curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's something that needs to change and that's something that me and other people are fighting to change. Um, in Alabama, when prayer was removed from schools, everyone went AWOL and blamed it on uh, gay people like me and you <laughs> for whatever reason. So it's a little bit harder to fight for to bring inclusive curriculum in schools. However, um, there is inclusive curriculum in a way meaning that we that they're teaching about queer people but not their queerness if that makes sense mm -hmm. and that's as close as we get to it yeah 
I totally understand that. Thank you so much for informing us. Um, like that's just that's really frustrating that it sounds it sounds super frustrating. Zach, what's a, what's your experience been like with queer curriculum in your school? To be honest, um, I you know I mentioned at the beginning I come from Maryland. Um, we're a very liberal state, um, and to be frank, it's lacking. Um, we learned about Marsha P. Johnson for maybe six seconds in the course of a five minute lesson about Stonewall um, that happened once. And so I think it's really important that we talk about inclusive curriculum in a sense of having it in already integrated into normal, integrate into your everyday classes. So like it shouldn't have to be a separate mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus studies course, which is great in itself um, for the representation. But it's important that LGBTQ, like LGBTQ history is American history. Like this should be in, you know, world history, you know, throughout the whole lot. And so um, I think it even goes on to talk about, you know, intersectionality, which I think is what we also need to touch on, um, where several states now are going to ban critical race theory and the teaching of systemic racism in our schools. Um, it's very backward when we should be using education as a way to educate um, and not hide the truth. And instead, you know, give students and the youth and the next generation the information they need to be the next leaders of tomorrow. Oh my gosh, I like got chills. That was so powerful. Thank I also want to touch more on the critical race theory. I live in Texas, so it's like I literally it's getting there but with steps like these it seems like all we're doing is going backwards so i'm really glad that like it can be seen to highlight these super important things so thank y'all for bringing that up um hammy your turn so you're up for supportive educators so in your mind what does a supportive educator mean to you as like a teacher someone who visually supports people and doesn't high that they support people because I have teachers in the past that I figured out like, oh, wow, they do support me, but I would have never known because they didn't speak up when a gay kid was being bullied in class. So I feel like someone who verb verbally and visually represents, posit positively represents people. So ex for example, in the classroom, like uh, having up a pride flag, or having up a Black Lives Matter flag, or having up a Palestine flag, you know, something that that shows that, hey, I support you. And I feel like if I saw that, then I feel, or <laughs> any kid saw that, then I feel like they would feel a lot better being in that environment, or a lot more comfortable being in that environment. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Three of my teachers that I've counted so far at my school all have up pride flags in their classroom. One of them I'm taking their class this year, which I'm really excited about. So I, it just feels so validating to see like that. It seems so little to anyone else from the outside, but it's like inside I'll walk into that class and think I belong here and I'm seen here. So I'm really glad that we both agree with that. So what sort of difference do you think it makes for an LGBTQ plus student to be in a classroom with a supportive teacher? Um, well, first, it will highly decrease um, mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts because growing up, I had a lot of suicidal thoughts. Hello, trauma dump. Um, so <laughs> it's because, not funny. Uh, Stop. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it, it will feel make LGBTQ plus kids feel less alone and i feel like with them feeling less alone um it will also help with their mental health as well mm -hmm. because i know I totally personally agree. it will help with mine mm -hmm. i think that's super true and i'd probably feel a lot more loved if i had that kind of environment at my school which i kind of do but you know if i had more of it i would be like oh my gosh so yeah so what are some qualities that you've admired in your most supportive teachers well, if I'm going to be quite honest, all of my teachers, which I know some of you will be watching this, you personally could have done better. So, how do you yeah, think they could have done better? Do you think how they could have done better um, by visually showing and also 
visually showing their support and verbally showing their support. There's no reason that a gay kid should be bullied to the point where they have to leave the school. And you are aware of the bullying because it's happening in your classroom. So, I mean, yes, you could do better. It's a hard truth. Do you think that, I know that you're leaving high school, you're a senior. Do you think that it's gonna get better now that you've had this opportunity to spread your word? And get better where specifically? Just do you think that like what you said will resonate as deeply as it has with all of us? I do feel like it will get better, but it takes time. Especially if we're talking specifically in Alabama, it's going to take a lot of time because Alabama is still stuck in, t in the 1950s and the people who believe the same things I do are too scared to speak up about it. So I feel like if you believe the same way I do, then I feel like you need to use your voice to make a change because change isn't going to happen by staying stagnant at all. So, I mean, it's a hard truth, but I feel like the only way how it's going to get better is if people who think like me, which I know a lot of people here think like me, but they want to blend in with the majority so there's no change that's going to happen here. It's a hard world that I, we live in. It's, it's a hard Alabama I live in, but you know, <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah. No, I see you and I hear you. Zach, what kind of supportive teachers have you had in your life? Do you have any that you remember specifically? Yeah, and first I, I just, want to thank Hemi. Um, that was very emotional and powerful. And uh, yeah, I think we all here really do appreciate um, your honesty um, and, you know, sharing this with all of the viewers of the ATP summit. Um, but back to the main question, you know, I have had supportive educators. Um, you know, I've, I've had a teacher hang a, a pride flag in her classroom and it's great. Um, but, you know, it, it it's to a point where it's like, that's great, but let's make sure we don't stop there. Mm -hmm. um, it's like almost performative activism, right. doing the bare minimum. Let's, let's keep going. You know, on the roster you send out um, on the first day of school or the syllabus where you ask the kids their parents' emails and all that, say, you know, what name do you want me to use around students? What name do you want me to use around parents? What name do you want me to use around other teachers? Same thing with pronouns. You know, ask what pronouns do you use? Where can I use which pronouns? Um, especially for students who are still questioning or are still on their own personal journey. Um, I think that's super important. So, you know, I've had great teachers, I've had supportive ones, but I think, I think, you know, let's take it a step further and really dive past just the pride flag. Mm -hmm. I agree. That would be super, super important. Jace, have you had any super supportive teachers that you remember? Um, again, I'm incredibly lucky to be at the school that I'm at right now because most of Every, every teacher that I've had has been mostly supporting, um, you know, queer people and, and people of color. And, and so I've been, I've been really blessed to have teachers who support me and care enough about these issues to, you know, rally behind the GSA when we need it and to, you know, show, show their support and not just say that they're supportive. I think that's a really important thing for teachers to do. Um, I've had some teachers who, when asked about queer topics, said, like, I'm not allowed to talk about that or kind of just, like, brushed off a question about it, which, you know, it hurts, but it's it's great to have all these other teachers who believe in you and, and want to support you. We've had a lot of problems with our district, so the administration, but I haven't had many problems with individual teachers <clears throat> um, I know it's been a hard year um, for a lot of people at my school because with um, the yearbook, a lot of people in my yearbook were dead named, which is unfortunate. And it's really hard at our school to, you know, get your name changed in the system. You know, I was really lucky and I um, changed it really quickly when I moved here, but it was I know it's been a struggle for a lot of my other trans friends in the yearbook who have to 
you know, who bought this yearbook and, you know, it's their, it's their legacy, you know, their senior year. Um, and it, you know, has their dead name, which is just really unfortunate. And I feel like that, that could have been avoided. Um, and I know a lot of teachers, you know, feel like they don't really need to do anything about this, but I know, like Hemi was saying, like if my teachers are watching, there are some of you that I know that can do more to help us because while we were having problems this year, some teachers decided to just, you know, sit and watch instead of taking action that they could have. But our district is also kind of weird because I've talked to some other teachers at elementary schools and they've said like, we're afraid of getting fired for talking about this kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's a fine line and it's a double-edged sword because you don't know if the teacher doesn't support the queer community or if they, you know, feel like they can't. Mm -hmm. I totally understand. So also I just kind of had this question that I thought of for the group. Jace, we can still keep the spotlight on you for a second. Do you think that teachers most of the time or whichever, however you feel, do you think they've been pretty supportive about like dead names within their students and pronouns? I've had, seen. I've had maybe two or three teachers, if that, every year ask for people's pronouns, which, you know, is good, you know, like, like, wow, I'm, I'm so happy that they're giving us this option. I, I know that they can do more. Um, as a member of the GSA, I send out an email to every teacher at the beginning of the year and I say, please ask your students for their pronouns. Please ask them what they're comfortable with when you talk to their parents or, you know, their guardian, you know, what their preferred name is, you know, what name they should use when calling home, that kind of stuff. And only maybe a couple teachers every year do it. So I think that they could be doing more, but I think it's great that there there are some teachers who are taking that extra step to support. Mm -hmm. Like it's a step, even if it's yeah, small, you know? it's a step in the right direction. And I feel like these teachers are leading by example, but you know the other teachers need to to jump on the train. Mm -hmm. Hemi, what has been your experience? Have teachers ever really given any thought or notice to dead names and pronouns and asking about this? No. Um... No, not honest, honestly, no. Uh, but however, even though they personally wouldn't use them, I would correct them in class uh, no matter what. I do not, I necessarily did not care if they want to argue with that because I know in, personally that I'm in the right. Um, but once again, there's some teachers that want to, but they don't want to seem like the odd one out. And which I found, which I find to be ridiculous because you have a moment to fight for somebody and yet you decide to be the one that throws the rock. It just makes no sense to me. And they genuinely think that it's like some, like it's okay. So I feel like once again, Alabama could do better. Um, are we getting there? No, it's slow because of, for whatever reason, because we're a religious state, we use, I use religious in quotation marks when in reality we're just homophobic. It's a homophobic state. They use religious as a umbrella term for what? I don't know, but yeah, no. It sounds really like invalidating to hear that teachers still aren't really caring about that. I'm so glad that you're using your voice and correcting them. And anyone who's watching right now, use your voice. Correct anyone that's wrong. Zach, what has been your experience with that kind of thing? Dead names and pronouns and teachers. It's um, been interesting. Um, you know, I think a <laughs> lot of my community um, in, in Maryland, like, thinks we're exempt, like a bubble exempt from racism, homophobia, transphobia, and like, oh, that doesn't happen here, um, and turn a blind eye to it, but it does happen here. Um, my, you know, I will never forget my freshman year when a, the health teacher I had at the time only referred to a student with their dead name, and the, um, 
always used their incorrect pronouns and it was a very bad situation for everybody to the point where we had students getting up and leaving the class. Um, I can report the teacher, teacher no longer is at the school. Um, but you know, it's, it's been a you know crazy time to think that, um, you know, we've come, we like to think we've come so far, but we haven't. Um, and you know, it's going to get better. It's getting better, but it's happening way too slowly. Um, you know, having LGBTQ youth, having one accepting adult in their lives decreases um, the rate of attempting suicide by 40%. 40%. You know, this is the matter of saving lives here. Um, this isn't something we can wait and push off. You know, lives every day are on the line. I agree. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, I wanted to ask about that teacher. How long did it take for your school to like make that choice to like get rid of that transphobic teacher? Do you know? That's pretty quick. Um, teacher wasn't there the next school year. Um, that's awesome. But I, you know, I think, I think that's, that's one, one anecdotal example. And I'm sure that happens thousands and thousands and thousands of schools across the country. And so mm -hmm. It's time that our leaders, um, you know, President Biden, Speaker Pelosi, uh, you know, our leaders come out and start talking about this. Our governors, superintendents, people, in, you know, saying that this is not okay, um, and, and and this crosses a line um, because I, I think you know, education doesn't need just to happen to students. I think a lot of the adults. Um, and, you know, adults and members of our community do need to be educated about this um, and that it's it's not a joking manner. I totally agree. And I'm really glad that your school has been as progressive as they are to get rid of those negative influences. Um, I also wanted to keep you on the pinpoint for your curriculum. So like inclusive curriculum, inclusive and supportive policies are super important. I think we can all agree that here. Um, Zach, how do schools how do school policies impact LGBTQ plus students for you, both good and bad, in your experience? Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of touched touched on it. The last question: um, one accepting adult decreases the rate of attempting suicide by forty percent, forty percent from one adult. Um, and so, what I think we have to do is look at, you know, what are our restroom policies? You know, do we have um, you, you know, forward thinking policies here uh, where we allow people to use the bathrooms. Like, is this hard? You know, allowing people to play sports, like real common sense things. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously policies that are good and policies that are bad. And we know the impacts that it has on, on students when they're bad. I would encourage everyone watching to go look up the Trevor Projects survey that just got published for this year that you know, is honestly very depressing about what's happening um, and what are in the minds of LGBTQ plus youth around the world. Um, actually, I, I, let me correct myself, around the country. And you know, I believe the number said 86% of LGBTQ plus youth said that recent politics have hurt their, have negatively impacted their well-being. 86%. Like, I, I can't even begin to imagine how this is, you know, in any sense of the word, okay, or justifiable for certain politicians. Um, so I, so I think I kind of went off on a tangent, but you know, all <laughs> good and bad have their impacts, and we know their impacts. <clears throat> that really resonated super deeply with me. I'm really glad that you said that. Um, so speaking of policies, I know that you kind of just said that, but just to go a little bit more in depth, what supportive policies would you want to see personally in school? Well. Let's let kids play sports. Um, I don't. I don't think that's hard. Let's let kids use the bathroom. I don't think that's that hard either. Um, and I, I think you know, like to me, that's like a bare minimum. Uh, like let's teach LGBTQ plus history. Like not not during Pride Month, not during LGBTQ plus History Month. Let's teach it year round. Like this isn't something where we should start and stop in the course of a week. We shouldn't only teach Black Lives Matter at school during one week. It shouldn't just happen in one month. Um, you know, we should be teaching this stuff year round and making sure kids know this isn't a this isn't you know a talking point. This isn't just 
oh, we're going to be woke and teach it for a week. This is like we care and we're going to show it and we're here to teach it all year round. Um, so that's definitely one really inclusive policy. I think that matters is so kids can see themselves reflected in the curriculum. Um, Glisten reports it's really important that students see a window into other people's lives and the lives of other people's identities and then a mirror of seeing students' own identities reflected. Um, so I, th I think that's just like real basic common sense policy. Mm, I totally understand that. Jace, do you have anything to say about that? I mean, I completely agree with what Zach is saying. I think that if you can turn off your activism, it's not real activism. Um, because, you know, like he said, you know, if you can show, you know, how quote unquote woke you are for a, for a week, you can show how woke you are all the time, 24 seven, because you have this capability of, you know, supporting, you know, black voices and queer voices and you have this ability to teach and educate and learn and help people understand but if you just decide not to do it then you're not an activist you're not an ally you are part of the problem and you are silencing these voices mm -hmm. i think those are some incredibly powerful words and i'm really glad that both of y'all shared with me thank you um, Zach, I had one last question for you. How do you think that we can protect these policies from future attacks? Because I think that we all know everyone always has something to say about the minority groups, no matter good or bad, just about whatever they want and not what like the majority of the minority would want. So how do you think we can protect those things? Uh, you know, I, I said it um, just before and, I, and I'll, I'll repeat it because I think it's important. Education isn't just for kids. Um, education shouldn't stop after high school, after college. You know, we need to continuously educate our population about the issues of queer youth today. And so something that I, I you know, it, it's Pride Month now that I'm thinking about, and I'm sure many queer youth thought about is, look at all these companies changing their logos to have a rainbow in them for one month. And then come July 1st at 12.01 a.m., they're gone. Like that's not doing anything. Uh, I won't call out any specific companies, but and you know half these companies are the ones donating to anti-LGBTQ plus politicians. Um, and so that leads me to the point of how do we protect these policies? One, let's elect LGBTQ plus people. Let's just let's let's stop with the idea of like oh we can elect pe like you know electing people who support it is great, but like let's elect people with that with the lived experience of being LGBTQ and, and knows what it's like and knows the effects of these trans exclusionary sports policies. Um, and so I think that's the first way is, you know, ed, so that educate the population and continue to be very loud and very vocal. You know, if you want to go, if, if you know, like make it clear to politicians, if you want to sponsor an anti-trans bill, we'll meet you in the elections next year. Like, you know, this isn't something where you can just stay here because nobody cares. Like we have to be involved, we have to be vigilant and we have to be ready to make our voices heard and put candidates up there. Um, because I, I, I think it was just today that the governor of Texas just signed a, a, a law about patriotic education, um, which sounds like a racist education. Um, but I mean, we just have to be ready and, and we have to be loud. Mm -hmm. Powerful, powerful words. Thank you, Zach. Um, Jace, I wanted to come back. I wanted to come back again to you about supportive student clubs. So, why do you think it's important to have a GSA on campus? I think kind of the same reason why all of this is important. Be, it's to show queer students that they are supported at your school. Because if you don't have this curriculum, if you don't have these educators, if you don't have the policies, and if you don't have the GSAs, they don't know. You know, they don't know that they're supported and they feel isolated and alone in their school because they feel like there's no one like them. You know, I see a lot of people posting about how before they went to Pride, they felt like there was no one else in their state who was queer. And it's like, you, nobody deserves to feel like that ever. And so kind of what we try to do with GSA is make sure that 
everybody feels seen. And so we teach these lessons about identities and we teach about, you know, different language and the history of, of queerness and flags and identities. And we teach about all this stuff so people know and they can go forth and live their lives as someone who isn't a bigot and someone who understands and doesn't have this, you know, unknown bias or prejudice. That's mm -hmm. why it's a GSA. It's a gay straight alliance because we want people who even aren't like part of the queer community. We want cishet people coming and learning this stuff so that they can be better people in their lives. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. So what has your experience been like in the GSA? I know you're the president, so cool. So what has been that kind of thing been like? Well, I'm not actually a president. I am the GSA's uh, gender and sexuality educator. So as a board member, I create lessons and I teach um, our members about all the stuff that I was just talking about. And I, I feel really passionate about it because this is something that I care so deeply about. And I think the people at our school, the teachers, the students, I feel like everyone really appreciates, you know, what the GSA has done. We've done, we've taken a lot of steps to promote equality and diversity and inclusivity at our school. And we've had a lot of people who supported us like student council. We have the Latinos in action club. They have always stuck with us and, and really helped out. And so I think, my GSA experience has been really positive. Um, but, you know, every year there's a lot of people who sign up and every year there's not a lot of people who actually come to the meetings. So, you know, fingers crossed, like every year we get more and more people who are learning about this stuff and becoming passionate about it and telling their friends and, and really getting the word out so that we can do our, an effective job at, at helping the community. Mm -hmm. I agree. I feel like that is kind of just a very big thing that always happens at GSA. So many people are so excited to come and then no one really does. Uh, Zach, do you have any words to add on to that? Yeah. Um, and, and this is just something that I think it was pretty heartwarming um, when I heard it was happening um, in my county is, um, well, not my county, but in the state as a greater whole is so for some policies require that after school activities for um, for middle schoolers require a parent signature. Um, and so for students who aren't out yet um, or aren't out to their families, that the joining a GSA and joining that community isn't an option available to them. And so um, something I heard was um, the educators in charge of that club would make the permission slip with just the acronym um, and, and give that to the, have the kids have their, their parents or guardians sign, but then have the kids would, you know, be smart and say it's like a gamers club, or they <laughs> invent another acronym just so they could join, um, which I think is certainly cool. But I think it's, you know, let's tear down the barriers. Let's just let kids join after school activities mm -hmm. and communities without parental consent. Um, I think that's, I think that's super important. So I just wanted to add that in there. Mm -hmm. I also think that's really important. Um, Jace, can you actually tell me what do you think educators can do to support GSAs more? I think that educators can come to the meetings. Um, you know, a lot of what GSAs do um, is, or at least ours, you know, we talk to teachers and, you know, like I said earlier, we send out these emails about like, here's why, you know, you should ask for your students' pronouns and stuff like that. And um, I think that, you know, come to the meetings, learn the stuff and teach it to your students. Like if I saw a history teacher in our room when we were talking about, you know, queer icons through the decades, like I would be so touched because I, you know, know that this teacher would consider putting it into their actual curriculum and teaching their students. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't know is that, you know, teachers don't know everything and that they need to learn stuff too. And so we really want to teach everybody and make it feel like everybody has a space to learn and to teach at the same time. Um, I know a lot of educators at my school have been putting their pronouns in their email signatures and stuff like that to parents. And what I've seen a lot is there's an article, I'm not sure who 
wrote the article, but it's an article. And so a lot of people in their email signature, they put, you know, their pronouns and then they link to this article, which is why pronouns are important and why you should, you know, put them in your, in your uh, email signatures. So I think that teachers really like, they can advocate for the GSA. They can learn stuff from the GSA. They can teach what they know and what they've, you know, the knowledge that they've acquired from, you know, the GSA and, and use it for their students. Like Zach said, for students who don't feel safe going to the GSA for whatever reason, you know, they can learn it in a class setting. Mm -hmm. I think that is so incredible that your teachers are so supportive. And you're right. It feels incredible to see someone that's usually higher up than you on the same level as you. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, I want to open up the questions to the group. Fun little activity. Um, starting with Hammy. So just repeat, the four pillars in the school that everyone needs are an inclusive curriculum, supportive educators, inclusive and supportive policies, and supportive student clubs like GSAs. Um, Hammy, what can students do to help achieve these four pillars at their school? Um, <laughs> I would say fight against uh, the board that tells you no. Fight against the board that tells you no, because Stonewall is the reason that we're here, and you need to do the same thing that Marsha P. and everyone else did that day. You need to fight against the oppressors to get somewhere. It might be slow, because as you can see, from 1960 to now, um, there has been changed, but there could be better change. It might be slow, but change is good. Take it step by step. Accept every win that you possibly can have. So fight against the oppressors. Mm -hmm. It's good trouble, yes, but don't get don't get arrested. But <laughs> okay, maybe. But no depends. <laughs> I mean, wait, no, don't, but you know. <laughs> I agree. Just for the um, record, the It Gets Better project is not sponsoring any violation of any law. Please look up the law in your state, and we are not advising anything along that nature. I All just think it's a legal team. If the law tells you that you can't be you, if the law tells you you can't be you, then don't listen to the law. Ain't nothing wait, wrong with wait, a little civil wait, disobedience. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, okay. Pull it together, so Hammy. Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, Zach. What can educators do to help establish these four pillars? Um, you know, I think I think what Hemi said really applies um, from students to educators. Uh, let's not forget, Pride was and still is a protest, um, and you know, it, it is a constant battle um, that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, I, I touched on beginning, but asking what pronouns and name to use with what people in the building and then what people at home, mm -hmm. I think is super important. Um, but then also, um, you know, like standing up, um, I, I believe the majority of states in America allow public testimony to happen at Board of Education meetings um, and at most state legislatures. And so, um, you know, take advantage of those opportunities, go testify, send your, like, send the emails, make the calls, call people who don't even live in your district. I, you know, I, I found myself calling Joe Manchin's office saying, let's abolish the filibuster and pass the Equality Act because it's about damn time. Um, <laughs> you know, like, you, you know, be heard. Um, you know, don't, don't think that um, your email isn't going to do anything. Because if you email and then 10,000 other people email, I'm, I, th I think it'll make an impact. Um, but, you know, all in all, educators, be supportive and accepting to your students. There is a big difference between acceptance and tolerance. And, and, and don't tolerate them. Accept them. Um, and so I think, I think that's a good place to start. A and listen to the students. I agree. Jace. What can attendees of the ATPE summit right now do to support LGBTQ plus students? I mean, Zach brought up a lot of great points. I mean, talk to your reps, vote, you know, I mean, 
Zach said everything I wanted to say <laughs> in that regard. Like literally your voice does make a difference and people think that it doesn't, but it really does. I mean, you can donate to organizations in your state or, you know, us too, maybe, um, <laughs> um, you know, the Trevor project, stuff like that. There's, you know, you can look up your local queer businesses. You know, I've been every week I say I want to try like a new queer owned business in my area, which is, you know, something that in, in Utah, I never thought that I would get the chance to do that. So I really am taking advantage of these opportunities, you know, you know, love your kids, love your students, um, do your research. Um, we have a lot of great stuff on our page about, you know, steps you can take research and like stories that you can listen to firsthand experience about, you know, the queer experience. And I feel like take in as much information as you can. Don't, af don't be afraid to be wrong. Don't be afraid to be make mistakes. Um, do your best. Um, and ask questions, you know, that's all I can really say is just try to be a good person. <laughs> I totally agree. Thank you everyone for joining me. Thank you, Zach, Cammy, and Jace for saying your beautiful, incredible words and, and educating us in the best way that you possibly could. Thank you to the It Gets Better Project for supporting us. To learn more, visit www.itgetsbetter.org slash youth voices. Enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Bye. 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 And please donate.